Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Seaweed Brain. We are in our post-season one era. It's been an amazing journey. And today we are going to be having a great conversation amongst ourselves about some of the technical aspects of what has gone into the season, including our thoughts on the documentary that has come out on Disney+, Plus, as well as a very special interview that Erica is going to be doing with Cassandra Ebner, the stunt double for Walker throughout the season. Stick around. I realize we've been doing a really bad job with being like professional podcast people who introduce ourselves at the beginning of every episode. Is that something that people do at the beginning of every episode? I think it is. I think normal people like introduce their names I guess because okay. they're like people with careers. And like yeah. that's just not us. We're not the film critic at the Philadelphia Inquirer. In fact, I need people to not know what my name is because <laughs> I have not stopped thinking tina Fey Fey. about how authenticity is dangerous authenticity is expensive expensive and dangerous and podcasts are forever and as somebody who like has a creative career as a performer people can't be knowing my thoughts about things and i'm getting more and more anxious about that by the day i actually watched the full lost culture this episode because of course tina Fey is i think one of the most interesting creatives who is alive and working and it was fascinating it was a top to bottom phenomenal episode you can't listen to it because it's Wow, look at me already delivering an authentic opinion. You can't just listen to it because it is Los Culturistas and you need a visual aid to figure out what's happening. <laughs> you need to I see actually... Matt shift his position in the chair to know when he's going to interrupt somebody or else you'll be like ill. I enter a fugue state whenever I listen to Los Culturistas while I'm cleaning my apartment. It's like I enter like a fever dream limbo state of being where I actually do follow everything that they're saying, but it's because I'm like in another realm. I hope that people feel that way about season one of our podcast, too. They're like, who's talking right now? Like, what's going on? And (laughs) where are we? (laughs) Yeah. Maybe I need to try listening to it again because the audio editing has gotten better. Like, literally two or three years ago, it was, was, like, painful. And now it's just, like... (laughs) distracting like i it, it, like it's hard to comprehend it's supposed to hard to hear streams of people talking but anyway yeah the tina fey episode is phenomenal and right before and after they actually debrief on it more where bowen is like i it's important to me to like live a creative life where this kind of thing that we're doing right here on this podcast is still yeah. a part of it and that yeah. i have an opportunity to do things that i think are interesting with friends and have opinions and really think through yeah how I feel about art in a critical way, but also Tina's right. And I do need to acknowledge that all of those things have costs that like having a smart, insightful opinion is not just going to be a benefit to his career. (laughs) All magic comes with a price. Deary. Real. It's true. Deary. Yeah. mm -hmm. That will not be the first once upon a time reference on this episode. And you need to listen to the end. If you want to hear the second one, no spoilers. Yeah. That being said, Next week, we're going to drop our final thoughts on season one. So (laughs) stay tuned for some dangerous and authentic opinions, I guess. I agree, though. I think it's important to me as a person to be able to still have this space. And I think that there's like a level to which you can offer your authentic opinions on things that comes from a place of like constructive criticism as opposed to complaining. Yeah. And I think the dangerous line is when you're trying to be funny. Because when you're trying to be funny, that's when yeah. anything will come out of your mouth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think that, yeah, you will be willing to reach further for the stronger punchline. But I think it cuts both ways. We're like, sometimes if the joke, like, if we were like funny, funny people, if the joke were genuinely excellent, I think we could get away with it. I think that we are people who are humorous. You know, oh, yeah. I would consider myself to be a humorous thing. person. This is why I shouldn't listen to Los Culturistas like within four days of recording Seaweed Brain. They're not good role models for this, <laughs> I fear. <laughs> and our audio is getting more disorganized right now. Shout out to them. They get away with it. Um, but we're here to talk about something specific, unlike Los Culturistas. <laughs> Los Culturistas. We have an agenda and a plan for today. And the agenda and plan is going to begin with us talking about the documentary and generally technical aspects of the show because do- the documentary, I think. A, was announced pretty last minute, but then for the time that we're able to mull over what it may or may not cover, I think we weren't super sure and we thought it was going to maybe be a little more holistic, a little more focused on the kids maybe. And the kids are definitely a big part of it and you like meet several of their family members and such, but I would say that primarily the documentary is a piece, it, it is it, it is peeling back the curtain on a lot of the technical artistry that goes into the 
film production. So we're talking stunts. We're talking how do you use the volume and shoot on it. We're talking set designs, the logistics of shuttling the kids into hair and makeup and tutoring and costume fittings and acting coaching and stunt training. And I, I like those are the vibes. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to know more specifically, I know Liam did an interview with the directors and they were brought on like later into the filming process. Like it wasn't like they were planning on doing a documentary. Disney wasn't planning on doing this documentary like from the jump mm-hmm. necessarily. They were like, we have all this footage that we filmed. You can film yes. some more and then put it together and make a documentary. Found um, footage. Yeah. Yeah. It was cute. And I know like they wanted to, the documentary people obviously like, Our first, my first thought, I'm sure a lot of y'all's first thought too, was like, show us the self-tapes. Like, show us more from the audition (laughs) process. I want to see Arian's self-tapes I really thought it was going to be about the kids. The more that I think about it, I'm like, that, even if they, they could make another one. They left enough on the table (laughs) that they really could. They could do one for season two. And the reason they couldn't do things like share the actor's self-tapes was because of the strike. At the time that they were putting all of this together, the actor strike was still happening. So they weren't able to like, you know, work alongside the actors to like use some, some extra footage, I guess that they didn't already have, but it was still cute that they, there was enough foresight into the making of this documentary that we got the little scenes with like Arian interviewing Lynn. I think Walker interviewed Adam Copeland. Walker interviews Adam Copeland. Yeah. (laughs) Those are both so fun. You know, what was missing was Leah interviewing Jessica Parker Kennedy. (gasps) Do we think episode three was too early? Like maybe they weren't thinking about the documentary yet. Maybe they weren't thinking about it yet. Maybe they thought that it was not a close enough analog. Also, I will say I am on episode six of Black Sail season one. I know I'm incredibly late, but I'm here. I'm happy to be here. To be fair, it was really hard to watch the show in terms of logins until pretty recently. I'm trying to watch it all in seven days because I'm on a free stars trial. It's a dangerous, authentic... That's not even an opinion. That's a statement. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Anyway, you know, something else that we need to do is thank our patrons. You're so correct. I don't want our patrons to think we've forgotten about them because we've done a lot of interviews that like previously that are, you know, getting released scattered around the schedule, but we do have to thank some new patrons. Um, And overall, just thank you to all of our patrons who've been here and joined us during the show. We obviously got a lot of new friends during the process of all of these TV episodes. And we'll be making more Patreon content again soon after taking... A bit of a break. We're going to do our Oscars. We're also going to do Avatar The Last Airbender on Patreon. Talk about dangerous and authentic opinions. That will be the place (laughs) where they go. (laughs) We have to thank today Isaac, Kale, Island, Booteful, Outlander, April, Vizicat, and Tara. And as always, we want to thank our sustaining patrons, Dayton, Justin, and Nathan. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash seaweedbrain. We literally can't wait to start doing more episodes there soon. Yeah, it's true. And yeah, in case anyone was curious about what the future of this podcast looks like, we don't really know. Um, But (laughs) we have a bunch of cool interviews coming up. I would say for the future of forever, we're going to continue to be talking to everyone who is involved in this TV show forever like truly carter and i have already committed the rest of our lives and sold our souls to continue doing this podcast until we die so (laughs) you can continue to expect interviews we're also going to do our season two preparation where we figure out how we would do every single episode of season two based on sea of monsters and talk about it in grave detail and then we're also eventually going to get to read the wrath of the triple goddess when it comes out in the fall that probably won't take us all the way until season two getting released, um, depending on how long pre and post production is. But we will figure things out as we go. And we still haven't read the Kane Chronicles. That's true. We have a number of options, including the Kane Chronicles. And I think we had some conversations as well about trying to... I feel like there is so much to say about season one. And interviews are one way to get at those types of conversations. And the other way is by seeking out people who have specific backgrounds or interests or expertises to bring to the table who are not necessarily a part of the production. Yeah. We, you know, may or may not be prepping a music episode. We may or may not be prepping a 
person who doesn't know anything about the books episode. We're definitely um, also <laughs> going to do a Persebeth centric episode now that we have seen the journey in its entirety, tracking it through the entirety of season one. Persebeth in review, Western civilization in review, perhaps. Yeah, we've got special specific <laughs> topic analysis episodes as well as interviews and then eventually season two prep and then also Wrath of the Triple Goddess on the horizon. All of that being said, I'm actually really excited that we did this little intro portion here because I was getting really afraid that I was going to have to release the first ever episode of Seaweed Brain <gasps> without Carter ever. And I didn't want to do that. I think about that. I was. I, I didn't want to do that because, like, it will happen eventually. Because for people who don't know, Carter is currently doing a PhD, and their life is very busy. And we live on different <laughs> coasts now, and scheduling is hard. And eventually, there will be an episode where one of us can't be there. But I didn't want that day to be today yet, you know. And it isn't. It Look can at be us. delayed. Here we are. <laughs> but yeah, I got to do this awesome interview with Cassandra, who is such an awesome and kind person. If you liked our episode with Trevor and Eli, the stunt coordinators, this is more of a behind the scenes peek into the stunt work. We wanted to combine this with a brief conversation about the documentary because Cassandra is heavily featured in the documentary. Um, I won't spoil anything that she says, but we talk about that a little bit in the interview. Our experience watching the documentary, I mean, you can literally watch us watch it for the first time on YouTube if you haven't That's already. That's true. Because we were all together, us, Monster Donut, Newest Olympian, and Robert from the Damn Meme page. We watched it together. The best part of the documentary was when we saw Robert in the documentary wearing our hoodie that says Camp Half-Blood Counselor. <laughs> you can get that on our Public. <laughs> that was really fun. Also, my mom texted me immediately because she watched the documentary and she was like, Erica, why weren't you standing next to Robert when they were filming <laughs> Robert? And I was like, Jennifer, I was. I literally tried to walk across that camera so many times times I tried to do an artsy wipe, you know, so that they could like <laughs> catch my orange. I just think my cosplay wasn't good enough for them because I even asked them. I was like, what are you filming? Don't you want to interview me? And they just could not care less. <laughs> I guess that is the lesson is that we all need to be like Robert and have visual signifiers that are very striking and tall. Yeah. The detective Pikachu hat. Yeah. We need to become like fascinator people, maybe. Fascinator? Yeah, like you clip like a mini tiny little hat into your hair that has like a huge feather coming out of it. Do you want to, I would do that if you did it with me. Specifically, Don't tempt me with a tiny hat. Specifically, if we were ever at a place where there might be Disney cameras rolling, I think now that we've had this conversation, we got to roll up with, with fascinators so that they know we're cool, interesting people. Who can be spotted from really far away. I think what we need to do is prepare like really intricate Hunters of Artemis cosplays so that we can whip them out whenever we need them. Because I've been recycling the uh, same Nico D'Angelo outfit for like a year yeah. now. Mm -hmm. We need like a silver circlet and the hunting jacket and the camo. Like a silver glowy like puffer is I yeah. think how it's described in some parts of the book. And like silver arrows. We could do that. We could also really commit to Grey Sisters cosplay. <laughs> like, we're gonna, it's, it's just the eye thing, right? We roll around in dirt. <laughs> a cab to bring with us, maybe, that's silver. Oh, we could, like, do, like, a cardboard box thing where we're both standing inside cardboard the cardboard box, box and we have it, like, over our shoulders. Lightly slapping each other and, like, throwing an eyeball around. Yeah. Yeah, but then we would need one extra person. That's true. There are three. The third one could be, like, a dummy that we support between the two of us, Weekend and Bernie style. Okay, now I'm seeing the vision. We need to go to a craft store. All right. All that being said, please now enjoy this conversation with Cassandra Ebner. Yay! Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. I know that the, the life of a stunt person, much like anybody in the industry, you're, like, constantly jumping between different projects. So I know you're in the middle of something else right now. Thank you so much for taking time to come join us on our podcast and reminisce about Percy Jackson. Of course. I loved the show and working on it so much. So when you said, can you be on it? I was like, uh, yeah, let's talk about Percy Jackson. <laughs> Heck yeah. And I, we were just saying, like, we, we just talked to Trevor and Eli a few yes. weeks ago. And so I'm going to ask you a lot of the same questions I asked them because I am, like, literally deeply fascinated by what you do. How did you get into stunt work? What was your pathway into this industry? So everybody's pathway is different. Maybe Eli and Trevor already said that. But my journey was I was a YouTuber growing up back in the day when YouTube was like starting. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, this is a, an audio medium, not a visual one. Cassandra's setup is beautiful right now. We've got like neon <laughs> lights in the background. We've got the Twitch streamer chair, like we're vibing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I grew up uh, making my own movies when I was like 13. And then I played rugby in high school. And then like I kind of did everything that I could that was related to film in my small town. Because I was like, I want to get into the film industry. Ever since I was like a little girl, I was like four years old. And I was like, I want to be a superhero. But yeah. I didn't know what like that was necessarily. Like I thought 
it was acting. So I did like a lot of acting. But then once I learned how to film make and I saw people on YouTube doing stunts, I was like, that, that's what I want to do. And so I kind of tried doing my own sort of like training for stunts. And then eventually my dad connected me with a stunt coordinator because he was like, you are so into this still, like for like two years. He was like, we're going to go talk to a stunt coordinator that I know that I grew up with. He like, uh, he used to like live together in Edmonton with the stunt coordinator. But at the time they were just buds doing theater. Wow. Yeah, it's a small world. So we went down to Vancouver, BC and I talked with him and he was like, it's really hard to get in. Like you can't wear any pads. Like you have to be super tough. And everything he was saying, I was like, this makes me want to do it more. So my super stubborn self was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And so he gave me a list of things that I should do. I'm obviously paraphrasing the journey a little bit. (laughs) Sure. But I'm like fast tracking you. And so once I graduated, I moved to Vancouver and was in search of the stunt community to like learn more, find where the classes were, try to get all the skills that like people were telling me about. And my YouTube fans connected me with two stunt people here in Vancouver. So because of them, I was able to like get and meet so many people. And then I started training at all the places, volunteering on stunt projects and volunteering on projects and became a PA and kind of just like did everything I could to get into stunts. So cut to one of my very first gags was getting hit by a car because they needed somebody (laughs) who could act and who was not going to run away from a car. So yeah, totally. <laughs> I did that and that kind of like skyrocketed and people started to know me from there and just got really involved with the community and and it's been really great because I like all those people are like my friends. So it's been pretty cool. Wow. So after that first fateful getting hit by a car, how many times would you say you've been hit by a car now? That was it. That was that it. Was, that was the only like, time. Some people have never been hit by a car. So like everybody was like, what? Like you're getting hit by a car? Like this is a dream stunt. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I don't know what's happening. It was so cool. Like it was like out of a movie experience. Like they called me. I went to the producers. They met me. I went to wardrobe and I was like, what is happening? And then they brought me here. Then they hit me with a car a bunch of times that was padded. And then I was like, where am I? And then I was on a bridge and dancing in Arrow season one and got hit by a car. Wow. So you booked like a big stunt. That was a big deal. It was that first job. I was really grateful. I don't know where I would be if I hadn't gotten that. That's just so cool. Um, What do you think is like the biggest misconception people have about stunt work or about (laughs) being a stunt person? The biggest misconception is that like, well, it's different because everybody does stunts, I think, for a different reason. But I think people are like, oh, you guys must like to get hurt. Like that's Whoa. like a thing people always think. And then we're like, well, we're used to it. It's not like we seek out, like I'm not like on my weekend and I'm like, ah, oh, I just want to punch walls and break my fingers. Like yes. that's <laughs> not my pastime. It's about how can we make something look gnarly and or like magical or something like that. And how do we do it in a way that's safe? So that's like our job is to like, make magic and make it look like it's hurting, even though it does sometimes. But like, that's kind of what our job is to do is make it safe. Movie magic. Movie magic. Movie magic. That's so funny because I actually, my next question that I was going to ask you was like, what do you do for fun? Like literally, what do you do? What does a stunt performer do on the weekend? Or do you like crochet and knit because you need to do something quiet? Or do you like go bungee jumping? You know what? You are like right on to the like right path. It kind of depends on like what I'm doing for work at the moment. So like if I'm not working all the time, I'm probably training on my weekends and it kind of becomes like a lifestyle. Um, If I'm working and I've been training a lot at work, then I will probably like play video games and train some stuff on the weekend or like repair my body. Mm -hmm. And like another thing that I like to do like in my spare time is make my own movies. So I still like to do that when I have the time. That's beautiful. I love that you still do that because it fulfills your creative drive and it feeds your soul to do the thing that you started doing in the first place. Yeah, I try to remember that. Sometimes it's really hard because you're busy and you're tired, but to like fight for the reason why you do it is I think so important because you want to appreciate 
the opportunities and and getting to do this and you want to keep like the love for it, you know? Oh, yeah. Because sometimes opportunities, you know, they come and go, whatever you think you get to a point in your career as like an artist or a performer where you're like, oh, now I've made it because people are paying me to do the thing I want to do. But it's great to be able to go back and be like, at the end of the day, I do it because I enjoy doing it. And it's just fun. That's really, really important to me because I yeah. like working, especially with kids. Kids are like so authentic and I want to be authentic with them. And so like if I'm loving my job, then that like rubs off on them. In theory, I would like to think that. Yes. So like that's super important to me. Thank you for that delicious segue into working with kids on Percy Jackson. Did you know anything about Percy Jackson when you booked this job? Yeah. So, um, yes, I have. I hadn't. Okay. I don't know if I should say this. I hadn't read the books. <laughs> That's fine. But I watched the movies. Uh huh. And I actually worked on the movies as a background extra. You too? Oh yes. my gosh. Because Eli was like, yeah, I, I doubled for Logan in a couple things in that those movies. That's so cool. Yeah. So I think it was the second season I worked as background on there. And I was watching all the stunt people climb this contraption that was like spinning. And yes. I was like, oh my gosh, they're getting to do the coolest stuff. And I was like, I want to be like them one day. And when I said I wanted to be like them one day, I didn't know that I was setting myself up in the future to possibly double for <laughs> Percy Jackson. <laughs> yes. Is that – okay, what just came to mind was the spinning thing that they have at Camp Half-Blood at the beginning of Sea of Monsters. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. During the like the fallout boy light them up sequence. I, I believe so. I believe so. I don't remember. It was like <laughs> so long ago, but I think that's what it was. Wow. Okay. This is a big deal. Literally like you are half of Percy Jackson. <laughs> oh, well, Walker is so freaking talented that like I got to like help get him to the places that he needed to get and like Eli yeah. and Trevor and everybody helped like the whole stunt team helped him get there and I was like mostly a cheerleader for a lot of it like sometimes right. I like filled in when they the kids pumpkined so like if they were in a precarious place like up on a ledge really high I would be the back of Percy Jackson's head but Walker did so much of it like he did the fight scenes and like we threw him into some of the rigs and like he was into it like so yes. I can't say I'm half of Percy Jackson I'm like <laughs> I'm like uh maybe a quarter I I don't even know like he was so good it was like awesome yeah I was really curious about I mean I'm sure you've you've done a lot of doubling work for kids because of your height, yes. right? Your like height and size, you work a lot with kids. Do you feel like you take on sort of like a mentorship role as you're working with them? I don't know. Like I've never really thought of my, maybe I should think of that as my job, but my personal journey with working with kids is to make sure that they have a good time. So I don't yeah. know if they're necessarily like looking up to me or if they're like, that's my goofy stunt double. I was going to say like, you're so their cool aunt. It might be something like that or the nerdy one because I'm like so nerdy and yeah. the kids like are kind of used to that. So like, I don't know, they might look up to me like because of the physical stuff, but I just try to make them feel safe so that like yeah. I'm a safe person and that they can come hang out, come talk to me. And if they're feeling anything that like doesn't feel good, which no one usually has told me those things because they've yeah. usually felt pretty confident being in the spot that they're in. But that's like the environment I try to keep because the stunt coordinator is kind of the person to like look up to. And then I try to like create an environment that's like fun for them, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So I got a little bit of a glimpse into the process of what it takes to train, especially all these young people for like a show that has this much action in it. I know that Trevor and Eli set up like a little like a warehouse where they invited the kids to come and train together, even the ones who maybe like weren't doing as much stunt work, um, just so everybody could kind of like get that movement in their bodies. How much like work do you do with the kids before like you're on set together doing the actual thing? It, every show is different. If you have the mm -hmm. prep time to be able to do that, then you teach them before. But a lot of the time – stuff is moving so quickly on other shows that I come in and I usually do it. But because we mm -hmm. had the prep time, we were able to teach the kids how to do these things so that they could be safe in this environment and do it themselves. Yeah. So we had the time with Walker to show him fight scenes and I would do it and show him how I did it. And then we would plug him in and I would let him know like anything that like helped with footwork or being in the right spot for a block and just like stuff that 
um, he might not be thinking about, I put those little notes in to make it like as safe yeah. as possible or to make him look as like powerful as possible. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Like a little like like coaching sort of on the yeah. side. And I'm not the only one who did that, just so you know. The right. whole stunt team was like part of that process and yeah. like would coach through and Trevor's job was to create the fights and then empower them to like feel confident, look confident and be in that. And like I would put my two cents in when it was appropriate timing. And uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I was there for. Totally. Okay. And there's a number of like very iconic set pieces throughout the season. Capture the flag is amazing. Even the Minotaur fight in the first episode is huge. We have the fall off the St. Louis, Louis arch. Um, and then there's the Aries fight and Luke fight. I'm super curious about the fall off of the arch because I saw you in the documentary <laughs> present as that was happening. I know there was like, there was fire involved. There was water. There were, there were wires. Um, any like thing you want to talk about from, from that period of filming that big fall. So we did the fight scene against the chimera and that was a lot of the pieces that I actually ended up doing was the hit or Walker did a lot of the fight. I don't want to yeah. pass that up. And I would do like the dangerous like hits into walls and stuff like that. Sure. So um, I did the the last hit from the Chimera going through the hole where the fire was. Right. And then um, kind of tried to like make it look like my hand was like dragging down so that it made sense why he was able to like grab on. I actually have that on my Instagram so you can like see a replay of it. Mm -hmm. So he did like all – the wire work holding there. He did all of that and we set it up previously on another day so that it was super safe for him to do and had limiters on the wires so that he could never go backwards and flip over or anything. Mm -hmm. So there's like a lot of prep work that goes into like making sure the actor can do it and it's like super, super safe. So he did yeah. all of that. That's amazing. I also heard, I believe, that it, there was real fire. Like that was not CGI fire. There was like a flamethrower or yes. something. Yes, it was real fire. I can't remember. I was not feeling well that day. So it kind yeah. of is blurry, honestly. It's a blur. <laughs> it's, uh, there was real fire. Um, and uh, then the next day when he did all his own stunts, there was somebody who filled in for me because I actually was really, really sick that day <laughs> yeah that you were like is it the fever or is it the flame yeah i didn't know in am my i face? on fire no just a fever <laughs> what's the technical stunt industry term for like thing that blows flames mm, uh that's a great question uh like a like flame fire gun i don't know actually <laughs> I should know this. Um, flamethrower is usually what I call it, but I said yeah, it the okay. other day, and I, I think I accidentally said blowtorch the other day because I was talking to people nope, about that, it. But the blowtorch is sense too. Like little. Little one. I think so. Gigantic Disney Plus blowtorch. Exactly. For, yeah. <laughs> There's just like the guy who's like in the corner like doing a tiny little blowtorch onto the <laughs> – whatever lights it, it it was really good yeah the special effects by the way they worked really hard to make sure that like all the fire was controlled just to wow. put it out there not like we just like lit the set on fire and we're like <laughs> yay we'll see how it happens it was all controlled by the special effects team and i believe it was i don't want to go into like what they do because i don't want yeah. to like misinterpret what they it's a whole it's other a whole ball other game yeah oh my gosh yeah wow would you say like is, is special effects probably one of the the departments that stunts works with the most? Yes. Your questions yeah. are so good, by the way. You like oh. really get it. Um, I'm just really curious. <laughs> I want to do stunt training so bad. Like it's my dream to get to learn how to like use knives on a movie, you know? Oh, uh, so good. So bad. <laughs> There's probably something where you live, like probably some sort of combat training that you could probably get into. All the cool like LA stunt gyms, I follow them on Instagram and I watch people do backflips and stuff, but I haven't really looked into like actual like like stunt gyms in New York. Um, I'm sure I'm sure there are some. There's a whole community there. So ah. yeah, you should definitely seek out and like go play or something. I need to just learn how to do a backflip so I can put it on my resume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does backflip whenever needed. <laughs> whenever needed, yeah. Um, but yes, we do work with um, special effects quite closely because a lot of the stuff there's like an explosion and that falls into special effects and or yeah. there's like uh, debris that's falling and that's special effects. So we work with them quite yeah. closely. But like all the departments have some sort of like um, connection. Um, so like Eli, the stunt coordinator, would right. 
talk to one of those departments to make sure that we can make this stunt the safe like safest mm -hmm. um as possible um so like he might talk to like the art department and get like a pad painted into the set and just stuff like that so he works yeah. closely with all the departments is stunt coordinator sort of like the final form of a stunt performer is that what you aspire towards like becoming like the man in charge or um i i still like to leave my like options open. I'm not quite sure yeah. where my path is going to take me. Um, uh -huh. But there's some people who transition into stunt coordinating and there's some mm -hmm. people who transition into driving. A lot of the driving, it's usually like the generation that's like paved the way and they do the stunt driving. Oh, wow. um, and I've been working really hard on that and really enjoy stunt driving. And so I've been drifting a lot. Can you explain what stunt driving is? Yeah, stunt driving, like whenever you see a movie where there's a car, like in Percy Jackson, where the car, yes. the kids were driving the car, there was uh -huh. a stunt driver in the car. And um, that sequence was actually when I was sick again. So I, I, uh, I, <laughs> I that was within like the same week that like everything Vancouver happened. is cold and chilly. Yeah. We got to change the weather so you're not getting cold so much. Oh, <laughs> man. I just like get sick all the time. This is so funny. Yeah. But um. So there was a stunt double for Walker who did a lot of the um, car stops and all that. So what you do as a stunt driver is you make stuff look dangerous, but it's really safe. Right. So you stop on a mark. Like sometimes you know how there's like a shot and the wheels roll in and like hit a perfect mark. Somebody yeah. has to learn how to do that. It's not easy because you have to yeah. like get it perfectly in frame. And then what if you're sliding a car and then you have to get it perfectly on a mark? So there's like – a bunch of different things people train to like make cars do stunts essentially. Yeah, people are just so talented. There's like endless things you can like transition to. And yeah, the two things that I told you about aren't necessarily like every single person's way. Yeah. There's lots of different avenues people can go after like stunt performing for a long time. There's like stunt performers who are like in their 60s who are still falling down and they're like so jacked and it's like so inspiring. And I bet they take such good care of their knees. Yeah. Yeah. They're just always doing cool downs and they're they're taking care of their bodies. Yeah. So they can fall down and get back up. That's inspiring. Yeah. It's super <laughs> inspiring. When people are like, you can't do that. I'm like, I know a person who does that and I am not taking no for an answer. Absolutely. Was there like a favorite stunt that you got to do or like be part of or like help like help Walker with throughout the season? Is there one that really stands out? I really liked – I really liked teaching um, Walker and Charlie how to do the fight at the end. That was super fun because we – it was Christmas time right before the break. And so uh -huh. we got to come in. We had like Christmas lights set up for the kids and stuff. And um, we put on Pirates of the Caribbean – so that they could yes. fight to Paris. <laughs> Charlie <laughs> told us about this. <laughs> yeah. I think the video is out there now too. Yeah. And it was just like so fun to get them to do that. And like that's – like I want to make memories for kids, like especially when mm. they're like working. And like I want their experience to be super positive. And so like that was super fun to be a part of. And like there was other stunts we taught Walker how to do. But that like one was like I just loved seeing their faces light up and have a great time. That sequence just looks so good. I mean, we have said it like 19 times now on the podcast between like our finale discussion and, you know, talking to Charlie and talking to Trevor and Eli, but like that sequence just blew our minds and it was so beautiful. It was so well done. And the way that the dialogue wove into the action, everything about it, Charlie and Walker really like, they really nailed it. Oh Especially yeah. Especially we, the way that it's not just, it doesn't just look good, but the way that they're fighting says so much about their characters the way that Char we felt, I mean, our, you know, layman interpretation of it, like the way that Charlie was like pushing Walker around and Walker's like flying as he's, you know, trying to defend himself and not hurt Charlie. It really looked like, you know, backbiters, this big, heavy sword that we were like, it's a metaphor for the way that the gods are weighing him down. I love Versus, it. Like, the little tiny riptide, you know, like just like trying to protect himself and he's so much more agile because he's not as burdened. Yeah. Yeah. That, I don't know. That was what we really felt watching that scene. It was just amazing. Oh, I'm so glad. Like I – it's so cool because uh, Trevor took the script, broke it down and tried to create something that like really went with the story of what the kids were going through. And I'm so glad that like you guys saw glimpses into like what Trevor created because it's pretty – it's pretty cool when your work like 
like actually inspires people and excites them. Yeah. I have a very silly non-Percy Jackson question yes. before we end here. I think but I saw on your IMDb that you did an episode of Once Upon a Time. Yes. Okay. Do you remember literally anything about that? Because we love that TV show. Um. Yeah. I, I was so excited to be there because like I loved Disney stories. And so like I felt yeah. like I was part of Disney and I was like losing my mind when I got there. Um. So I doubled for Belle because Belle was like the same size as me. And there was mm-hmm. like a rowboat scene that I did. There was like a fall down like a – um. I worked on a few episodes, but – uh, there was like a fall down something being chased by a bear of some sort. And then I doubled the little boy as well one season because he was um, shorter. And so yeah. I doubled him driving the car in a scene and he like fails to drive the car and like parks like really bad. That's kind of some of the stuff I did on the show. That's so cool. Yeah, we <laughs> we were big fans of Once Upon a Time. It's like the silliest TV show and it ran for so long. It was so good. That makes sense. It was so good and it makes sense that like so many people like we who we've like talked to have like tangential like association with it because it was a it was a long running network show. It was, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cassandra, for spending a bit of your evening with us, taking time out of your busy schedule. Your life is so cool. <laughs> if there's anyone listening to this, particularly young people or not young people, you can be 60 and drive a car and fall down, fall into a flamethrower. Yep. Any advice that you would give to people who are like, wow, this sounds like something cool that I would like to get into? I think the advice that comes to mind for me right now is like be innovative because a lot of people, uh, it's not like one path for anybody. People will give you lots of no's or there's like a place that you can't train or any of those things or you don't have the money to train, go volunteer at like a Taekwondo school. Maybe you had a friend in school who did gymnastics and you're like, hey, can I trade skills with you? I'll teach you how to do this. You can teach me how to do this. Like if you want to do this, you have to love it because there's going to be so many roadblocks and you have to be ready to dodge them or go around them or fight swords through them. And so that's my advice to anybody who wants to get into stunts. Yes. Trading skills is so important. And like, if you don't have any money, like just go into a grassy area somewhere and, and trade skills with your friends. Totally. I used to do that. I used to like bring a bow staff out to a field and I would just teach myself how to do bow staff stuff. And it's like, just pick something up and try it safely, safely, but <laughs> <laughs> but safely. Yes. <laughs> but play like that's kind of like we all used to play as kids and we mm-hmm. all did sword fighting with the Christmas wrapping paper. Oh, yeah. Or pool noodles. Yeah. We well, can be creative and have fun and like, yeah, just be innovative. Hashtag butt safely. Yeah. But say hashtag butt safely. That's the stunt performer motto. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you're like, I want to go light myself on fire, I would really recommend that you do that in a safe environment. Like don't uh, <laughs> don't just go try that at home. Um, this is not what I'm saying, but – There's stuff that you can do on your own that doesn't necessarily require money right away. We all have the availability to try. There's so much stuff on YouTube. Um, Yeah. Yes. Uh, Cassandra, where can people find you on the internet? Be that, you know, Instagram, if you want to plug your Twitch, like anything you would like to share. (laughs) Um, I have a Instagram that I post on quite a bit. Uh, It's Cassandra.Ebner. It's C-A-S-S-A-N-D-R-A dot E-B-N-E-R. That's pretty much my handle almost everywhere or my like really old YouTube videos are nerds4l and that's like also my um, Twitch as well if you want to come hang out once in a while. But it's once in a blue moon that I Twitch, like very rarely. (laughs) Okay, we'll have all of that linked in our show notes. Everybody go follow Cassandra. Join me all in doing a deep dive into um, your old YouTube. That'll be great. (laughs) I was so young. It was like 15 years old and I didn't know what I was doing. That's how I feel when people start listening to our podcast from like the very first episode we did. I'm like, why would you do that? Yeah. You should at least skip a year and a half into the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like there's other things you can watch, which is Croft fan film. That was like my first ever sort of like stunt acting thing. And it got like over 14 million views. Trevor directed it. And so mm-hmm. I was part of that. Or you can check out Life XP, which I wrote, starred in, got the funding for, and it went around the world, went to Cannes. And come on. Yeah. And um, it's a web series on YouTube you can watch. And it was heavily inspired by the guild Felicia Day. I don't know if you've heard of Felicia Day, but she's amazing and super inspiring. And it's like a gaming um, web series. And 
is super cute. And so if you guys want to watch it, that's like more of my like later stuff as opposed to like me talking to a camera and being like, I'm doing my laundry today. <laughs> like Absolutely. Okay. Everybody check all of that out. Congratulations. Literally every single person involved, like congratulations on the season two renewal. That's yes. huge. Yeah, it's so Future. exciting. Like there's so many people that like uh like I obviously got to do a lot of um walker stunts so my face is like a little bit more seen. There's like six, seven other people that like y'all don't get to see and they helped make so much happen and they were like such a big part of our team and um shout out to them because they were so much fun and helped create an environment that was like super great for the kids and super great for all of us big kids. Yay, big kids playing, but safely. But safely. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for joining us. Join us in thanking Cassandra. Say a little quiet thank you out loud to yourself, whether you're driving in your car or doing your laundry right now. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>